followed by a pizza party about noon. Um, Charity Day Sale, see Shirley Riggleman. If you would like a ticket to the Charity Day Sale, is November 3rd, 4th, and 5th. All right. I hope you have all those announcements down. All right, let's see. It is time to sing our praise chorus. 2129. December of 1944, a strange occurrence happened. A Japanese lieutenant by the name of Hiru Onoda was stationed on a, an island of Luban, a tiny little island in the Philippines. 
And within weeks of his arrival there, a U.S. attack force basically took the island and forced all of the Japanese combatants who were there into the jungle where they remained hidden until declared that the war was over. But the interesting thing is, is that when that declaration occurred, he didn't get the memo. And he remained hidden in the jungle, still fighting the war for almost 30 years. Discovered in 1974 by an eccentric Japanese explorer, he absolutely refused to surrender and give up his arms and walk out of the jungle unless his commanding officer from Japan could be flown over and could come to him in uniform and inform him that he, he was to surrender and that the war was over. And obviously that occurred. He made an interesting statement after he did this as he was coming out of the jungle in still full Japanese uniform, almost 30 years later. He stated that he had developed so many fixed ideas about the war that he was unable to understand anything that did not conform to them. He was very set in his ways. He was very difficult to lead and basically a very stiff-necked person as is the title of today's sermon. Now, the passage that we're going to read from uh, Matthew is really very simple. It's a message from Jesus to the Jewish leadership at the time that he was addressing that you can't be stiff-necked, that you have to allow that the kingdom of God through me, through Jesus Christ, is for everyone. So if you would join me on the parable of the wedding banquet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of God is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. But they refused. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who I have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and then burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So, go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people that they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And the man was absolutely speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. The word of God for the people of God. I was born in August and I'm a Leo according to my zodiac sign anyway. My wife was born in May, and she is a Gemini. Now, we Leos are known for our stubbornness mm -hmm. and strong, strong obedience to tradition. Yeah. Now, that can be very difficult. It makes us very rigid in thinking and makes us where we, we just don't accept change very well. Gemini's, on the other hand, are flexible. They're extroverted. And 
they're really, really clever. And there's never a boring moment when they're around. They're not afraid to take a chance on anything. While we Leos, we stubbornly insist that the old way is the best way. And we resist change tremendously, just like that Japanese soldier did. I am sure our extremely contrasting styles have over the years provided Laurie and I a balance to our lives that has many times helped us. Sometimes, of course, tradition is good and provides tremendous comfort to us, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Whether actual or perceived. But other times, being a risk taker is the fact that we open new doors with it, new opportunities that otherwise they would have never occurred. They see that glass is half full, whereas the others see it as half empty. Now, Jesus' parable in Matthew that I just read about a wedding banquet gone wrong is a challenge for all of us, but particularly it's a challenge for those of us who adhere to tradition strongly because we traditional people have certain perceived notions about things, you know, especially about weddings and wedding banquets and, golly, about kings and biblical times in general. And this parable is going to challenge all of those ideas. We are, all of us, rightly mystified by the behavior of the characters in this bizarre but brief story that Jesus told. An initial invitation to a feast in honor of the king's son is met with rejection. Focus on two words here now. King and son. Hmm, think about that for a second. That may seem odd to logic because we ask why would anyone in those days and times turn down a royal summons? Then a second invitation by the king sweetens the deal, doesn't it? He has descriptions of elaborate food preparations for everybody. It's going to be delicious with yum, yummy prime rib, and everybody should be wanting to come. Who wouldn't want to join this party? But those invited are apparently still unimpressed with what's going on, and they're returning to their business as usual. But again, we traditionalists say that this is unusual behavior. We become, uh, we, we have to become actually at this point more flexible thinkers. And we have to say that this kind of strangeness is probably not all that unusual if it's a parable told by Jesus. Of course, what happens next? <laughs> Things go completely off the rails in this parable. We watch almost in horror as the servants sent by the king to announce the party are, number one, seized, number two, abused, and then murdered. Didn't see that coming, did we? Hmm. How did the stakes suddenly in this parable get so high? And the weirdness and the violence are just getting started. In retaliation, the king goes to war against his own people. My goodness. He is enraged, enraged by their actions, and he unleashes an army on them. And before we know it, the murderers themselves are murdered. And their city, presumably the king's own city, is burned as a pile of smoldering ash. Now at this point, we traditionalists are thinking this is just, this is too unreal. But we've got to have a little hint of curiosity here that tells us there's got to be more to this story. To add to that, the story at this point turns and becomes even more weird. With our heads still spinning, we learn that the dinner is still on. He hasn't canceled the king, hasn't canceled the dinner. And the invitations go out again. But this time, they go out to the commoners. 
on the main streets of the destroyed city. Apparently, while the soldiers pillaged and slashed and burned, all the while great flames devouring the buildings around them, the sumptuous dishes that the king had prepared were kept hot for the eventual guest. So, we're going to have to take a chance here and see how this parable ends. No doubt to you right now, this is somewhat of a disturbing story. Maybe even inflammatory to you as you look at it and you think about it. So, even with my traditionalist thinking, I'm going to have to admit right now, i got to lower my stakes a little bit of realism. And by doing that, maybe we can start to answer some questions about what's going on here. Why is this narrative so tortured in its twists and plots? Perhaps one answer is that here, Matthew is giving us an allegory of salvation history. At the end of the first century, Matthew's community, if you remember, was in conflict, serious conflict, with the traditional religious beliefs of his time. And this story is actually a tool in itself for thinking about the meaning of that conflict. So let's look at the parable from a different point of view. Jesus, right now in this parable, was addressing an audience of faithful Jews and their leaders. Faithful religious people, people who considered themselves to be the salt of the earth. What if, when we take a look at this parable, those original people invited were indeed all of these faithful people? They believed that they were God's chosen people, and they were the original ones invited to the feast by the king, in the parable. Being God's chosen in their mind was all that was required of them to enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, in order to be invited to the wedding feast. And as you know, Jesus was bringing a different message here. From John 14, verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that very statement was blasphemy to the Pharisees at the time. That's why the Sanhedrin ultimately put him on trial. Now we look at the people who ignored the servants. Could they be like the Israelites who ignored the prophets who came to deliver the message of God and perhaps those during Christ's ministry who refused to believe in him. Those who then reacted violently could be a reference to those in previous years or current who mistreated or murdered the prophets and the messengers of God and foretold the actual rejection that was coming of Jesus Christ. Perhaps the final guests who were invited were very simply, the Gentiles, or maybe a mixed group, but the final group had to be all believers. Now, this parable shows that the kingdom of God is open to everyone, not just one group or one culture or one way of thinking. So if one group is, in, is rejected, then another group is invited. Matthew may have been assuring his own community of followers who believed that Jesus was the Messiah that they were on the right side of salvation history. And that group, by the way, was growing larger every single day. And it became filled with not just Jews, but with everyone, Gentiles, everyone who heard Christ and gathered to hear him became believers. Still, we need to read this story to the end because we've got two more revelations in this story coming. And both of these revelations are real, real doozies. Traditional thinking is going to take a hit again. First, with the party in full swing, the king enters the banquet hall and moves among the guests 
And to his dismay, he finds one poor guy in there who is not dressed properly. Friend, he says, how do you get in here without a wedding robe? And receiving no satisfactory answer from the poor man, he has the guy bound and thrown out, literally, not just outside the hall, but into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Sounds an awful lot like the <clears throat> place down below, doesn't it? That doesn't sound too good for the guy, does it? Now, with friends like that, who needs enemies, right? Again, my logical side is really in non-belief. Of course, of course, the poor guy wasn't dressed properly. He was literally yanked right off the streets at the last minute. But again, we got allegory here and not realism, and that's what's calling the shots. Matthew is warning his community against self-satisfaction. The king, God, is no pushover. And if the guests are beneficiaries of an unexpectedly generous invitation, then they must be on guard against complacency shown by the first invitees. The doors of the community, the kingdom, are thrown wide open. But this invitation that's been given extends literally to all, to everyone who is willing to receive it. But once you come in the door and accept the invitation, there are standards. Hmm. You can't go on acting like you are an extraordinary party unless you want to get yeah, an ordinary party, excuse me, unless you want to be thrown out. But even if appropriate clothing is a metaphor for the need for appropriate behavior in this new and inclusive community, the parable may be saying more here than we actually expected. Maybe Matthew originally intended this as a stern warning to all of us that when we are invited, we have to live up to the standards of the party to the standards of higher righteousness. The problem with the person in the wrong clothing is not that he's not taking things seriously enough. His problem is a failure to party. Think about that. The kingdom of heaven is a banquet, after all. And if you've got to go to the party, what do you got to do? You got to put on your party dress. Yeah, you got to get with the program. Kingdom music is playing, and it's time to get up on the dance floor and take part in what the activities are. Swedish theologian Karl Barth says about the parable, In our last resort, it all boils down to the fact that an invitation is given here to a feast, and that he who does not obey and come accordingly, and therefore festively to the party, declines and spurns the invitation no less than those who are unwilling in the first place to obey and to appear at all. That's a really eloquent way of saying that when you come to the party, you got to be prepared for a complete commitment to Jesus. Let's go back to that word we started with. What was that word? Stubborn and stiff-necked. It can be a nasty state of the personality, can it? And nasty state that sometimes people are stubborn because of their past experiences, their traditions, their culture, just like that Japanese soldier who don't want to leave behind or go away from that which gives them comfort in a certain way. But sometimes it seems like people are just playing out stubborn for no good reason at all, other than they're just too wrapped up in themselves at the time. And after reading and interpreting this parable, I must admit that I'm a little nervous about my stubborn side because I'm guilty as charged about that sometimes. I will admit. Curiously, another word for stubborn in biblical times, as we have just said, is stiff-necked. It can also mean stiff-necked difficult to lead. Let's consider a biblical reference about it 
from the 40 or so that directly quote it or that allude to it in the Bible from 2 Corinthians verse 30. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord. The ancient Israelites, you can bet, were familiar with this term, stiff neck. So when the Lord used it to describe them, they got the message. It's in a practical sense, if you want to bring it down to that, a farmer well understood frustration of trying to plow a field or transport a cart if they had an ox that was stiff necked an ox that refused to be guided. And what a disappointment it would be to the farmer that the ox was therefore not performing the task as intended. In Exodus, God's chosen people refused to love him and to honor him and to obey him. They were not living the purpose for which God chose them. God made his will very clear to them. Their disobedience was rightfully referred to as being stiff-necked and hard-hearted. As Israel rebelled against God, they ignored the signs that God was trying to redirect them to commitment to Jesus Christ. So, we move forward. A.D. 27 to 34, depending on what exactly this time frame is, but that's the generally thought about time when Jesus' last years were occurring and when he was crucified. And this is indeed just before Jesus is crucified. Jesus is being rejected at this time on all sides as the Messiah. So the parable offers us a serious reminder about commitment to Christ. Here's another expression, more important than stiffness, and it comes to mind. And that word is on the front of your bulletin, and that word is long haul. Jesus is reminding us that our commitment to God is not for the moment, but it's for the long haul. And it's a lifelong commitment to a party located on the path to salvation and love that includes everyone. It includes all of us. Jesus closes this parable with his final, final revelation. For many are invited, but few are chosen. We all receive the invitation, don't we, to believe. But those who are chosen are chosen due to their long-haul commitment to the party. And belief in Jesus Christ makes him the master of ceremonies of this party. Amen.
today as the ushers wait on you for your tithes and your offerings. Um, your offerings will help the church grow, serve, and love. You can mark your offering for the general fund to keep the church up and running. Also for the building fund, as we always have air conditioning needs or other uh, means of keeping our three buildings up and running. And also you can mark your offering for our apportionments to be paid by the end of the year. We're a little over 50% already. So as the ushers wait upon you, let's grow, serve, and love together. Concerns on the back of your little insert. We do have a few names to add, please. And we do welcome back uh, John Mooney, flew in last night from New York to be with us for a while. And hopefully, um, wife Mary will be joining him uh, the end of the month. We also welcome any other visitors with us for today or returning. Um, as we call them, snowbirds. <laughs> On the back of your flyer, uh, Ron Sunderhouse remains in the hospital. I talked to his uh, wife yesterday. Um, he's very discouraged. We need to pray for patience for him. Um, he does appreciate the cards and the prayers. And uh, Ron Sunderhouse is... Jerry Harn's brother-in-law. So keep Ron on the list. Also spoke to our Shane Wolf yesterday. Shane is very ill at home and also asked for our prayers. Uh, a friend of ours and that many of you know, uh, Linda Guest had emergency gallbladder surgery this week. She is in the Winter Haven Hospital. Linda Guest. Uh, Andrea has asked for prayers for um, her friend, Billy Newsom. Billy Newsom. That, that's, I 
our friend Nancy. I'm sorry, I didn't write. That's not Andrew. That's our friend. Oh, that's Jan. Okay. Sorry, sorry I didn't write my name on the bottom. All right, all right. Thank you, Jan. Jan Jaberti's friend, Billy Newsom, is uh, under hospice care. Continued prayers for Al Dorset's sister Kitty. Continued prayers for wife uh, Audrey as she's out in Texas and will be returning next weekend. And for all who are traveling this week. Yes. Hip replacement. I'm sorry, what was her name again? Barbara Budney. Barbara Budney. All right. All right, thank you. If you have any other additions or names to be removed from the list, please let the church office know. All right. If you will bow your heads with me in prayer. Dear Father, we come to you, your presence, as imperfect, sinful children who do many foolish things and who unwittingly are involved in much that is evil and corrupt. Forgive us, dear Lord. We come to you knowing that your love for us is overwhelming, reckless, and never-ending. Be gracious to us and free us from whatever harm and injury we may suffer in this earthly life. May we continue to walk the path of the disciple, which is not always the easiest road. Now guide us and direct us and give us the wisdom we need to bring your kingdom here on earth. Help us to embrace change and be willing to listen to one another. May your name be praised among all people as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciple to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're closing in. It's 338. We're ready. We're going to stand and say, Where are you me? I can hear my Savior calling.
of the day comes from Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26, and you will find it a very traditional benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.